2025 is fast becoming the dawn of a new age of artificial intelligence, an age of miracles. But what if I told you that the AI we know today might not be as good as it appears? That what lies underneath the glorious facade is not really intelligent. It's an imposter. AI can create breathtaking art from a single sentence, write complex code in seconds and converse with us like an old friend. This explosion of capability has led to a powerful and optimistic assumption that as we scale these models, their underlying understanding of the world will get better and better and yet. It's not just that they're beyond human understanding, it's that they're, they're trash. With conventional SGD, which is like the backbone of all of machine learning right now, you get a completely different kind of garbage representation, just total spaghetti. Total spaghetti. So if the internal wiring is a complete mess, how could it possibly produce such brilliant results on the outside? The surprising reason is that it's learned to fake it. Another good metaphor is to think of it as an imposter. The representation of the skull is just somehow a farce. If you just look at the output, it's great. It looks exactly like a skull. But underneath the hood, it's, it's not capturing any of the underlying components or the regularity. So in some sense, it's not really a skull. It's an imposter underneath the hood. To get familiar with the imposter, we have to look at the engine driving almost all of modern AI. The dominant method for training AI today is called Stochastic Gradient Descent, or SGD. It's basically a brute force search, painstakingly adjusting every single grain of sand over and over until its output matches the correct answer, until the thing looks like a sandcastle, basically. It works but a groundbreaking paper from Kenneth Stanley and his team reveals a big difference between the AI we build today and a different path we could have taken. By the way, Kenneth Stanley is a hero of mine. He wrote Why uh, Greatness Cannot Be Planned. The special edition show we did with him four years ago was peak MLST. But anyway, when you look at these internal representations created by SGD, to put it politely, they're a mess garbage representation, just total spaghetti. We came up with some terminology that we put in the paper to, to more like clearly articulate what these differences are. But basically you're talking about just amazing versus garbage. The question that the paper addresses is what does this mean? Which is something I think that has endless repercussions and potential applications. Um, like the fact that we're basing the entire field on something that produces this complete garbage under the hood. The paper gives this garbage representation a formal name, a fractured, entangled representation. It argues that concepts which should be unified are fractured and discombobulated into overlapping pieces, and behaviors which should be independent become entangled. It is, in essence, the difference between a deeper understanding and elaborate memorization. I can give you a personal example of that. So in yeah. high school, when I went to sign up for physics, for physics one, um, they put me in the one that was for people who had not had calculus. And I had had calculus, right? And so I'm in this class and I'm like, what the heck are we doing? We're just memorizing all these like long lists of equations, you know, for a cannonball in this situation. And they're like, oh, actually we put you in the wrong class. You have calculus, you're supposed to be over here. So after a week, I switched to the other one. It was so much easier because I knew calculus. So I, could, I didn't need yeah. to have a formula for this specific cannonball situation. I just could derive it or just yeah, calculate it directly. You know, it's radically different, different learning mode. This distinction is really important, basically whether intelligence can only replicate what it's seen versus one which can go on to create something new. Two mathematicians, they can both ace like a math exam and one can go on to become like a great mathematician that discovers a lot of things in the field and the other one can go on to discover nothing. It doesn't give you a picture of what we really care about, which is downstream, like how they influence the field and how their research progress carries out. Today's large language models are the second mathematician. They ace the benchmark test but they are imposters, lacking the deep, structured understanding required for inventive creativity, which is to say, taking the next step forwards out of the box. But what if there's another way? The paper discusses another leading paradigm, founded in an old online experiment Kenneth did many years ago called Pick Breeder. Pick Breeder system allowed people to effectively breed pictures. We found inside of the system that the people 
who would decide they want a certain image and try to evolve that image would fail. Um, and then people who are not looking for anything in particular would discover all these amazing things. Like the butterfly was kind of the symbol that we used because we put it on the front of the book. That one of these serendipitous kinds of discoveries. And this led to this idea that, well, you know, there's many things in the world that we're not going to be able to find if we directly search for them because of deception. And that's the underlying reason. We'll come back to this concept of deception and what it means later. But first, let's talk about this new architecture which improves on SGD. The way these new networks learn is completely different. The representations they create are beautiful. You know, they actually represent the objects at a deep, abstract level. Kenneth and his co-authors called this a unified, factored representation. Instead of a tangled mess, the system builds clean, modular, and shockingly intuitive models of the world. The underlying representations of these images, which are basically uh, represented, encoded by these neural networks, are absolutely incredible, amazing. And there was like no good explanation for how they could be as good as they are. They have unbelievable modular decomposition, which means that it's almost like it was engineered by a person. There's a network that, that generates the image of a skull and it, the network has decomposed it such that like there's a component of the network that's responsible for the mouth and can do things with the mouth like open and close the mouth or there's another dimension that can make the mouth smile. Would you believe me if I told you that this deep understanding materialized bottom up? It was built brick by brick as it were without being trained on a massive data set with billions of free parameters. Absolutely incredible mind blowing to me because it's like there's a world model of what a mouth is there without being data driven. Like how is that even possible? There's not a lot of data here, but we're getting world models out of this thing. This observation that it matters how you got to the solution, how it's represented under the hood, just hasn't gotten the light of day until now. Um, and it's, it's kind of a companion to the old insight from the book, you know, which is that sometimes the only way to find something is by not looking for it, but now there's this caveat. But even if you do by looking for it, you may pay a steep, steep price in terms of the underlying representation. The most intuitive evidence comes from sweeping the parameters or the factored representations, as Kenneth would call them. By changing a single connection in the network, you can actually see which factor of variation it represents. In this new type of network, sweeping these values results in a commensurate semantic change. It might be opening the mouth on a skull, or winking the eye on a face, or swinging the stem of an apple. It's like the network understands what these objects are at a deep level. In conventional networks, the same action just produces meaningless chaotic distortions. This is what we mean by the imposter. And in case you didn't get the memo, this is basically how ChatGPT works now. We needed to have a huge number of free parameters in the network to make it trainable, right? To make it statistically tractable. But it's precisely that reason that we end up with a sand castle. It looks like a castle, but it doesn't have any structural joints. It doesn't look anything like we know a castle to be. Why is one network a sandcastle and the other one the real deal? Well, the secret lies in abandoning the fixed objective in training and building bottom up, not chipping away top down like SGD does. We also need to embrace a counterintuitive notion called deception. Deception means the stepping stones that lead to these interesting artifacts that you might want to find don't resemble them. If you have an algorithm that's trying to follow a gradient by matching closer and closer and closer to the objective, getting a higher and higher score, you're going to get stuck in a dead end um, because of deception, um, because the things that lead to the thing you want actually don't look like the thing you want. And this is true in the lineage of many of these images in Pick Breeder. The paper showed the path to the skull in Pick Breeder. The key idea is that sometimes the stepping stones which lead to something important don't even resemble the thing you end up discovering. It might seem like total serendipity, total randomness, but humans have a no for what is interesting, which has a lot to do with the foundational cognitive prize which nature has bestowed to us through constraints in our evolution and physical environment, and of course our life experiences on top of that. On the road to getting an image of a skull, they were not thinking about skulls. When they discovered a symmetric object like an ancestor to the skull, they chose it even though it didn't look like a skull, but that caused symmetry to be locked into the representation. You know, from then on, symmetry was a convention that was respected as they then searched through the space of symmetric objects. 
And somehow this hierarchical locking in over time creates an unbelievably elegant hierarchy of representation. This hierarchical locking tells us something really important about how representations emerge. We think it's about finding the right building blocks now, but weirdly, it's about making future discoveries more likely. You know, a bit like how good code now reduces technical debt in the future. Bad code is the sandcastle. And there's an evolutionary principle which makes sure that these superior foundations win out over time. Pick Peter, I think what's especially what was at play was like the evolution of evolvability because people are only selecting for what they wanted, right? What they would look good. But implicitly, there's also an implicit selection pressure for evolvable things. So if there's like two versions of the skull, which is one is like spaghetti and one is like very modular and composable, after a few generations of evolution, the one that's more evolvable will be the one that wins out, right? Just like in natural evolution, the evolution of evolvability. And this evolvability combined with the serendipity is what I think gives you these nice representations. The thing that I think makes this really intriguing is that it gives you something that otherwise could never exist, which is a counterexample, that there actually do exist networks that don't have that issue. You would think that that's just intrinsic to neural representation, that somehow they just look like kind of entangled messes and that's just the way life is. But clearly it is not how life has to be. This leaves us with a choice, the path of a singular, goal-orientated kind of optimization, which creates brittle, fractured imposters, or the path of open-ended exploration, which ostensibly creates robust, unified models. They argue that this choice fundamentally impacts three important things that we want from AI, which is to say generalization, creativity, and continual learning. If you think of the skull again as a metaphor for all of human knowledge, because that's what an LLM is trying to capture. It's not just a single image. It's like an image of all of human knowledge. For any input, it should output something that's convincingly human. Then like it, it could be just similarly an imposter. It could be the same. Underneath the hood, everything could be organized wrong, not the way you expect. It's like a giant charade. And again, this is very confusing and counterintuitive. Like for, for, for people, because like, you know, people are naturally, including even me, I would react like, but should I really care? Like, like when you say it's an imposture, but it's getting everything right and it's human level. Like, what are you objecting to? Um, but, they, but the point is that it can still be an imposter because it's like what we care about here is not just that it's going to get answers right, like get good test scores, like seem to be plausibly human when you talk about things that are in distribution. We want it to be able to go outside, like to do things that are creative, to be able to continue to learn, like to do to, to get to the next level, including learn on its own and get to the next level. Um, I mean, these are like the next frontiers for the field. If it's an imposter underneath the hood, then these kinds of things are, are, are going to hit a wall or become insanely expensive. It could be that you can always push through that wall, but the expenses just go up and up like crazy. Exponential, worse, I don't know what it means, but it could be something terrible. We might already be seeing that. Like, you know, the amount of money that we're spending here raises questions like, is it necessary? Like, does it have to cost this much in energy and in money? So this flips everything on its head, right? The very thing we're trying to control, the objective, is a bottleneck for the thing we actually seek, creativity. True creativity might even be intelligence. I mean, it's certainly the nearest quantity I can think of to describe what intelligence is. Once I say that what you need to be good at is if I define where I want you to go and then, then you can get there, then I'm basically training you not to be able to be smart if you don't know where you're going. Like, but that's what creativity is. It's about being able to get somewhere and be intelligent even though you don't know where your destination is. The biggest risk may not be that our machines become too intelligent, but that we become too narrow in how we define intelligence. The blind pursuit of benchmarks and performance metrics might actually block us from discovering the real thing. I think uh, the one of the high level things we should be doing is not putting all our eggs in one basket, right? Okay. That's like the main point of the open ended this lesson is obviously there should be people scaling up these LLMs to see how far the current paradigm can get us. More people should look into 
you know, artificial life, pick breeder, and the ideas from our paper and uh, see, because I think it's a very promising direction. We need to build an AI which doesn't regurgitate patterns from its training data, but it actually understands the deep structure of the world. An AI that can look at new scientific challenges, that can discover entirely new principles. The path to artificial intelligence is not a straight line towards a known destination. It's a divergent, unpredictable, open-ended search into the unknown. It's possible that the most important discoveries that we will eventually make will be the ones we aren't even looking for now. And by the way, folks, if you want to watch the entire roughly two and a half hours worth of goodness with Kenneth and Arkash, his uh, co-author at MIT, um, yeah, we will be releasing that pretty much on our next episode. So hopefully this has whetted your appetite for that. Cheers.